from the Daily Dot, and Lucifer Means Lightbringer from the Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire. So speaking of tackling people, how many people had an urge to go and knock down the wall? <laughs> <laughs> Just for a second, I mean, I'm really not pushing over that. Yeah, I love knocking down walls. You yeah. have, That's yeah. my favorite. I was about to say. <laughs> we had people dressed up as Viserian, couldn't one of them have done that? We do have people dressed Somebody up. Somebody like dressed up as the wall last night. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And I hugged them. You hugged them? Did yeah. You, did we get a picture? No, I wasn't. I, I wasn't dressed as anything entertaining. Oh, I thought. We did a picture of a guy kicking it on the Antwerp and Antwerp. Okay, I'll take that. That's pretty good. Nice. If we had a Tyrion, it could have pissed off the top, but I guess. <laughs> That. Where do we sign up for the witty banter panel? Okay. This is it right here. <laughs> okay, it looks like it's about that time. It is noon o'clock in Dallas, Texas, and that means it's time to talk dragons. That's what it always means um, in Dallas at noon on a Sunday. Church of the Dragons is in session. You misspelled Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Dragon, cowboy, you can see how I got that crossed up. So I think something that's really important before we, uh, just as a intro, quick introduction here, um, I, as <coughs> most, we, I'm sure we have a mixture of book and show and both fans in here, but as someone who was read the books first, I think it's awesome that dragons are something that helped bring a lot of new readers into the uh, fandom into the group, into the community, and I think that's really cool. Uh, dragons have uh, that meta quality to them beyond the things we're going to discuss in, the, in this panel about them specifically in world. Uh, the, the fact that they're just a cool thing is uh, a great like fantasy kind of um, beacon, you know, and that's, uh, that's a great thing. But let's, uh, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Aziz from History of Westeros podcast, and uh, I'm a big fan of dragons, so um, that's why I'm here. And uh, Bex here. Hi, I'm Bex. I am a, a writer uh, with Watchers on the Wall, and I am uh, the drunk of Ice and Fire at the Star Calypse. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Michelle Jaworski. I write about Game of Thrones at the Daily Dot, and Dragons got me into Game of Thrones. Uh, pretty much that photo of Danny with Drogon on her shoulder at the end of season one. Kind of saw that, plus Ned, and I'm like, okay, like I think this is a show I might like. <laughs> so, yeah, I knew about Ned and Dragons, and then I was sold. Cool. I'm LML, Lucifer Means Lightbringer. I go by the Dragon LML on Twitter. <laughs> All about dragons. So <laughs> let's do it. There's some, someone we need to thank, but I forgot to look their name up, which is kind of silly of me. But George R. R. Martin, at the beginning of Game of Thrones, he writes an acknowledgment. He says, thanks to, I forget who it is for getting me to put the dragons in. So apparently he didn't initially want to put dragons in the story, but this person who I feel bad for not looking her name up. Marketing genius. Yes, they said are. <laughs> to do this, and we're all, we're all uh, here today. It's in, Phyllis in part because of that Eisenstein decision. or Eisenstein. Oh, awesome. Great. There it is, Phyllis. Thank you, Phyllis. Good call. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of, so dragons is a really, really wide open topic. There's a lot of ways we could approach this one. So we, we kind of talked about ahead of time letting you guys kind of help to steer the discussion because there's so many ways it can go. So definitely feel free to throw hands up and ask questions. We'll, be, we'll take them throughout rather than kind of holding them till the end, I think. Yeah, it's better. It usually uh -huh. works better. Okay, cool. Well, who wants to start? We can start with, uh, let's see, we can, we can throw up some hands just to see where you guys want us to go. Oh, we'll, we'll start right here. All right, so um, in the uh, Dance of Dragons people, or rogues, there were some dragons that uh, were still alive. Yeah. Like, say, the Cannibal and Moon Dancer so, and... Are they still out there? Are they still alive? We're told no, because we're, we're told that the last dragon died in 157 
and that. But isn't was that kind of an official history statement, like officially? The 153. Last? Sorry, but yeah, that is in a. It is. It's true. We don't know for sure. Okay. We know that sheep, and we know that sheep stealer almost certainly went with uh, nettles and lived in the Vale for quite a while, and we don't and, know for sure. And Valerian died, died of that. old age, right? Valerian so did die of old. There age. is a time limit. Yeah. How it was like 200 something. He was close to 200 years old. Yeah. Okay. So those dragons from the dance, if they were alive today, how old would they be? Probably too old. They right? would be too old. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they would be like. Well, there was old a, dragons yeah. in your homes. <laughs> like hey, when I was a boy, we used to take a direction with a single breath. But either way, I would like to get closure on what happened specifically to those dragons. We might, unfortunately, have to wait a long time for that because we're getting Fire and Blood Part Volume 1 this year, but Fire and Blood Volume 1 cuts off right at the end of the dance. So there's another 20 years for the, for the dragons to die out. So we, we probably won't get that full story until Fire and Blood Volume 2, which who knows when that's going to come. <laughs> so you were mentioning how George decided to exclude dragons. So what's the effect, do you think, of that, of that uh, decision? Like, what is, why, why do you think he did that? Or why did he, why did he go about that? Well, the, um, the story that he was telling, because um, he mentioned this, mentions this in a 2014 Rolling Stone interview, is he always wanted House Targaryen to have dragons as a symbol, but he was holding back on actually putting dragons, because with the exception in book one of like the White Walkers and the Whites, and I know they're the others, but you know, using show terminology here, and the dragons at the, at the end, it's there's really not that many like fantasy elements to it. it's it's very like medieval and you know like the whole thing of you know certain parts are kind of inspired by the war of the roses and it feels very very real and very like you know like some of this stuff could have actually happened you know until dragons come in <laughs> and yeah that's a great point I, I really feel like it was just george figuring out where that line was like i just only want to put a little bit of magic in if he hadn't done the dragons, it would have been like, okay, it's not enough. <laughs> oh, and, and the dire wolves too. Of course. Right. And also, I think it's like part of the end game because if they don't have dragons, I mean, things did not go well with Viserion. But if they didn't have any <laughs> dragons, I just think that they would just be like reduced, more fucked than they might already be. Stabbing. So, yeah. but I also think that they're kind of like a narrative exclamation point, and you can also see that on the show. It's like, oh, the dragons were in that episode. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Oh, I, I, I pointed at this gentleman yeah, over here. Okay. I, I've read all the mainline books, but none of like, the history extended universe things. You know, as dead dragons. We know of any that died in conditions where their bodies might have been preserved, like bogs, deserts. Probably they not. Be resurrected. Well, we, we know of several that uh, died during the dance whose. We, we've heard of their skulls being kept, and uh, you know, there yeah, was Vagar. Yeah. Yeah, Vagar fell into the gods, I like. Yeah, and Caraxes was down in there, too. Uh, and so we have a lot of. Um, when we have Ricaro, or one of Danny's blood riders finds a dragon skeleton out in the, in the Red Waste when they're searching in different directions. So that's a cool question, but no, I don't think we have any. Maybe on the Roin somewhere. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, maybe. Maybe something uh, preserved in the in the sorrows or in, in the, yeah, along the ruin. Because there were some 300 Let us know what you find. Came. And then there's the bigger question of how... You, you've given us hope. Bigger question of how long, like, a, some, a body, whether it's a human or a dragon, can be resurrected. Like, you know, because with, with Viserion, we see it pretty pretty quickly. And then also with a lot of the, the humans and the giants and all that, that the Night King rises raises from the dead, but if a dragon's dead for like 50 years, can they be brought back to life, or is there an expiration date on this whole resurrection thing? That's a good question. I wonder what like dragons brought back by Melisandre or Beric would be like. Whoa. <laughs> Damn, dude, we're going uh, deep. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Dangerous, I'd think. <laughs> question back there. Yeah. Uh, other than the three eggs that the nearest has, is there any speculation that there possibly might be more eggs? Yes, definitely. Yeah. For example, I think the world, the world of ice and fire, gave us probably what I think is the best clue for where Daenerys's eggs came from. Illyria says they came from the Shadowlands beyond Ashai, but that's probably a lie because we find out that that Ares, even the Mad King, still had fossilized eggs. So it seems like Varys just took those and gave them to Danny. That seems a lot simpler. And it, why not 
ha assume there was more than three. You know, he didn't need to give more. They're valuable, so he maybe just kept the rest. And we all know <laughs> there's one in, in the Winterfell Crypts, obviously, with John's name on it. So. <laughs> So, and then of course there's, there's Dragon bound Stone. to be a few others elsewhere. Yeah. A lot of them would have been destroyed at Summer Hall, but there's got to be some more elsewhere. They can't be the only ones. Ah, uh, um, Summer Hall. One thing that I'd just like to, to bring up and, you know, looking at the background of the dragons and Valyria and stuff, traditionally um, it's said that they had to be trained or they had to be um, brought around by sorcery to be controlled by the Targaryens, but... Danny doesn't really use either of those things, so I'm Love wondering that what topic. that says about Danny, or what that kind of just says about what's going on. So, does anybody here have thoughts about well, that? Well, there's a lot of stuff from Valeria that the Targaryens didn't bring. So, they no dragon horns, uh, no Valerian steel making, and um, what was the other one? The well, they do use the whips. That's the only thing we've seen. But only a few people use the whips. We only see Damon print uh, the robe prince use a whip, I think. Yeah. So you do really wonder. It's like the dragon horns are kind of thing you would have grabbed on the way out. Yeah. You know, if you but knew they you were... didn't. They didn't bring that. So that is really telling. They didn't. They didn't. The, the Targaryens didn't think to need them. So that almost tells you that the horns were invented as a way to what Euron's trying to do with them as a way to steal them. And the Targaryens didn't need them because they were already bonded. What I've wondered is, like, uh, was there a conscious choice to leave behind certain parts of Valeria? Because Valeria was awful. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe they, they didn't want to have that tool fall into someone else's hands. They and like, well, we're, we're, these are our dragons. No one's going to steal them unless like, they have a, Excuse me. Uh, like, method. Valerian steel might require blood sacrifice to make. It's strongly hinted at. So maybe that was yeah. like, well, this kind of thing isn't going to go over that well in Westeros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I, that makes a lot of sense. Um... I think also uh, there's pr certainly the, the term sorcery gets thrown out there, something they use to do dragons, and that's super wide open. What does that mean? But, yeah. but certainly we see none of it. But what, um, another thing, though, is that you know you read the histories of different things, and, and they get bonded with their writers, and there's a whole thing of testing Targaryens out with the dragons and seeing who fits together. But... I, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I think Daenerys is the first person who is like, I am the mother of these dragons. Yeah, we don't see anything like that <laughs> in, in L history. Let me ask you three. Um, do you think there's a, some sort of ancient green seer or a skin changer element in the origin of like the dragon bond? Is there some, is it like a twisted version of that or what do you think? I think that's maybe vaguely similar, but um, I know George was asked this correction, this question directly once at a convention. And he and said it's not the same, right? He said it's not the same. He says it's it's a lot. He said it's it's stronger than say, a, a, you know, a dog and their owner. You know, how right? Because Danny and Drogon owners, but have it's like nothing a... like, but it's not particularly like skin changing either. Because okay. Danny does have that Blackwood blood. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, Sandra. Basically, all this blood. So we have seen the fire. Like skin changing a dragon or something. I don't know, or like I don't know if working is magic Well, that's always that's been the thing, right? People are like, oh, the brass of their rider, brass of their rider. It's gonna be dragon yeah. warging, and so I mean, we we don't know. I mean, for sure, if that could happen or not, I don't yeah, think we really so. Don't. I, I mean, I think the, the I think the others, the the White Walkers, their version of raising the dead is kind of a bastardization of a corruption of skin changing. You know, because they're they're instead of animating living things, you're animating dead things. So yeah. I think that one way this could happen, the brand thing could work itself out, is maybe something the TV showed us, which is if a dragon does die, if a dragon does die, then this would be. Uh, and it's raised by the White Walkers. I don't see one of them flying on it like the show, but they would just be a dragon on their side. This would be a way for Bran to break that, I think. He wouldn't literally fly a dragon, but he would maybe take over this undead dragon. That would be sickening. Yeah, I would so freak out. That's just uh, one, po one possibility of many, because it's the, the, whole, the whole, yeah, when Bran is told, you will fly. People have been predicting he will be a dragon rider or a, a war dragon skin changer guy since the first book. And then when this happens in book five, it's like, nah, yeah, we're still pointing in this direction. And if you really narrow it down, like that's one thing that always is very telling. If you look at all who the possibilities for dragon riders are, there's not very many. It's like there's only you got like two dragons with about three or four candidates, and that's about it. So and so I think that feeds into like the whole Tyrion um, is a is a 
what a Targaryen or theory because then it's blood, like yeah. then it's like well then he could be the dragon rider. Oh. <laughs> and George, yeah, that's George goes back and forth on that. He's 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 muddied the waters for sure with that with that. We he saw what happened when out. somebody tried to like tame or get near a dragon who shouldn't have and who didn't have the right. Poor Quentin. <laughs> oh, and that's really interesting because we have no examples of someone who is clearly uh, has a lot of Targaryen blood being killed by a dragon um, while trying to tame it. We have certainly cases of a dragon killing somebody because their master ordered it, but we don't have any young Targaryen boy or girl trying to tame a dragon and it killing them. But There's what about no the that, what about the really story about like the young the young boys and they were trying to paired them with like the this one dragon did that kid not get killed or something no like he didn't there was well the, there were the dragon seeds who were the the people who were rumored bastards and some of them yeah but the as far as like say Aemond who, who who tamed Vagar he lost his eye but that was his brother stabbing him so one <laughs> one last thing if, if Bran brother does skin change a dragon either books or show I kind of think it might he might go insane and die because dragons are fire made flesh they're not like other animals. Yeah. And there's a lot of scenes um, where skin changers are forced out of their animals by heat or pain. Oh, and so I just wonder, like, if you try to put your mind into something that's fire-made flesh, is that like a suicide sacrifice? There might be something to do to, is, um, yeah. is now like some ice sort of weird flesh, yeah. ice fire. Yeah, yeah. so. That's a, that's Doesn't a sound theory. funny either. There's a couple like questions that. on that side of the room. Yeah, okay. In the blue? Yeah, two things. Um, in book one, Danny Three, she has that dream. Uh, where uh, she sees a, a, a dragon, the dragons have attached, who's clearly uh, very, very long, and he like fades her in dragon fire when she's like all in pain. And I think that that hints to a deep bonding between these two that he reached out from like the egg to give her this like yes. you know, how you know this uh, will to continue to survive. And I think that hints at like a, a deeper bond there than probably any other Targaryen has had with their dragon. Um, yes, and, that's a good point. And the other point was uh, about uh, Bran uh, skin changing. Viserion is probably the, the closest choice, being that I think that the um, the White Walkers slash others are are skin changers. Like the, the, uh, the Night's King is a skin changer. Yeah, that's yes. why they chose. That's why they were chosen in the first place, probably. I like this person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Viserion isn't really like Drogon or Rhaegal anymore. He's, he's different. He's become almost an inanimate object that gets like, you know, controlled by something else. It doesn't have a will of its own the way the other two dragons have it. And so therefore they are a lot less likely to get, you know, you know skin change. That would that would also explain probably why uh, if if indeed this theory that the walkers ma ability to control the dead is some sort of corruption of skin changing, it would explain why they can do so many at once. Right. Which is kind of because they're not really controlling a living thing; they're just animating dead flesh or whatever. So yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, if if it's a dead Viserion, there may not that may not be as problematic. But if he tries to do a live Viserion, maybe she she brings up a great point. I think one of the things, and full disclosure, I am a hardcore book nerd. I like the show. I'm basically only interested in the show in how it like sort of brings the books to life. But I will say that one thing that I think the show got sensationally right is showing Night King's ability to access the Weirwood net and to meet Bran inside the Weirwood yes. realm. Mm -hmm. I think that in the books, uh, we're not going to get a physical corporeal Night King, but if we get some sort of Night King, it's going to be like an evil presence in the Weirwood net, and Bran will be confronting it inside the Weirwood net. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I saw that episode, my mind started turning, and I was like, all the lot of clues that I had seen started making sense. So uh -huh. I think this is something the show got right. Cool. I think there'll be... Um I mean, maybe just for, I don't want to say ratings, but just, just for fun. I don't know. But I think there's going to be a, a, a dragon battle, though. Yeah. Doesn't there have to be? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think George would want to give us that. And I think it yeah. would be emotional if it was, like, Danny trying to kill one of her children. And we hear about the ice dragon, which, you know, could be, it sounds like from the descriptions of an ice dragon, it's some sort of creation of ice. But it doesn't have to be that. It could be... It can be this. It can also be both. <laughs> we can have an undead dragon and a dragon made of ice. Does everyone agree that Viserion's death was like one of the saddest deaths in the entire series? <laughs> That's like the sound that he made. Too. Oh my god. Maybe think of maybe think of so, maybe I mean, think of Lady back in I got, season. Yeah. I was yeah. so weirded out by Danny's reaction too, because she was like, 
There's a thing that is happening. Okay, let's get on this dragon. <laughs> so it's just like, it was weird. <laughs> Yeah. She didn't think that could happen, yeah. Also, And Danny's character has been headed in that direction to where she's able to make those choices. Yeah. She can she can grieve later, yeah. Yeah, she has to be able to do that. Otherwise it's Gotta compartmentalize, yeah, that's true. That's true. She was able to leave John behind. That will be hard. Oh, good she point. She's not. She has no idea that's coming. That's gonna be tough. None of them do. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, well Dan, when Danny meets in the show, when she is confronted by her dead child dragon, because of course we know that exists, exists, but she has not is not aware of this. That's yet. right. She doesn't know. So she's gonna be confronted. And, and for a long time, I've been predicting that we're gonna, as an audience, we're gonna see this. We're gonna see dead characters that it's going to be oh they're a white now oh that sucks like if we see like Hodor or like no. I don't know someone no. like it's Jamie I don't probably not Jamie but maybe you know just no. as like it's, let's gonna... talk about happy Bulls. things <laughs> yeah and the dragons will burn them all so <laughs> who has it okay you haven't gotten in your question yet yeah, yeah. And you know they talked about how the um, they would place the apes in the Targaryen babies' cribs. And yeah. Like, did those always those matches always work out? But no. Mm -mm. They often didn't, and they often, and that wasn't uh, apparent. It doesn't seem like the egg in the crib thing is that old of a tradition because we don't see that happening in during Aegon's conquest or shortly after. It seems to be something that developed maybe within the receipt proceedings uh, in the century following. We don't know exactly when it began, but for example, Aenys didn't, uh, Aenys didn't have an egg put in his crib, neither did uh, Magor, and I don't think the Jaehaerys or Alisand did either, but are, that are started happening a little later. Do we know that definitively, or could it just be a lack of information? It's the way that the way they the way they acquired their dragons makes oh, it okay. pretty clear that they didn't have. But if they had an egg, they didn't. If that's and not then the one there's they, the whole thing where with. they'd have a dragon, and then they'd like, okay, whose turn? Okay, yeah. let's try you. Like remember, Aemon claimed Vagar, <laughs> Magor claimed Balerion, Aenys was given Silverwing as a hatchling. Not it's described that way. Not that he had. Silverwing hatch with him. <laughs> or sorry, uh, Quicksilver. Yeah. So uh, David's right that it's not 100% confirmed, but the circumstances describing all the early dragon acquisitions by the Targaryens, there's nothing. Well, I yield to your knowledge. It doesn't honestly. really fit. It's possible, but it doesn't really fit. But to the point that was raised, the fact that there is this idea of putting the eggs in the cradles implies that there, there is, they're aware of the yeah. possibility of like a connection that can form even before the dragon's born, which That's is pretty true. cool. Uh, on that note, um, there's a, I don't remember who's here it was, but there's someone that, that goes through all of the um, Targaryen history and finds like a dragon hatcher and dragon writer, uh, like supposed hereditary gene that can go through. Yeah, that, that theory didn't actually work out very well, it doesn't, it's not really, it, it kind of falls apart. Yeah. Some Targaryens that seem to be able to hatch dragons, especially as a Targaryen lineage, starts to die out a little bit, and as there starts to be less Targaryens, maybe just less magic in the world, there seems to be less of ability to hatch dragons. So, so the question was um, about dragon hatchers and dragon riders in, in Targaryen in the family yeah. tree. Genetics. I guess whether there's certain Targaryens who have had more success hatching, basically. Yeah, I, I think there there's... I think there's another clue that might be more on point towards that, which is that they started moving where the dragons were. When they were in Dragonstone, they were near volcanoes, which is apparently really important, but then they opened the dragon pit. So not only did they have no more volcanoes, they put them in this kind of artificial enclosure, which was kind of controversial as far as them letting them reach So let me ask size. you this, Aziz. You may, uh, based on that, when the, before they invaded Westeros, Targaryens were chilling on Dragonstone for about a hundred years. Yeah. They came to Dragonstone with five dragons. Yeah. When they invaded Westeros, they only had one of those five, which was Balerion. The right. other two were born on Dragonstone. Yeah. So why in a hundred years of living on a volcano did they only manage to produce two new dragons well, one, that lived? One theory that I saw that I kind of like was that there was... Um, a miniature Dance of the Dragons 
among the Targaryens on Dragonstone. We kind of need all, something like that to explain it because when they came of, to Westeros, yeah. within a hundred years of when King Jaehaerys was king, they had like twenty-five dragons. Yeah, there was an explosion of dragons. An explosion. That, that, yeah, right after right. Angor. Um, and that's uh, there. Yeah, that's when there were like by the time of the Dance of the Dragons, which is a, uh, about a, eighty years after <laughs> Jaehaerys took the took the throne, there were over nineteen dragons. And uh, then after the dance, there were about maybe five. I feel like there's a mystery <laughs> there yeah. somewhere. Well, another thing is neat, the Targaryens, when they came, they brought a 3,000-year-old skull. That's one of the, the skulls that Tyrion remembers seeing in the basement. It's like, 3,000-year-old skull, damn. That's really, really, really old. <laughs> oh, and real quickly, uh, to the question of genetics and why Danny was able to hatch the dragons uh, when so many have not, it's, I, I can't get away from the fact that she has Dane blood mm -hmm. and Blackwood blood. And yeah. these are like two of the most mysterious, magical yeah. houses in the story. George, and so intentionally George made retconned all, uh, that, yeah. I think, in like the Storm of Swords, was it? That he added that detail? So Which one? Which uh, the, the Dane, um, the Dane, I guess it would be... I don't know if it was retcon, it was just kind of filled in. It was in Duncan was Egg. because it's before. Yeah. yeah. My yeah. interpretation was that, you know, she kind of had the eggs at the right time when magic was resurging in the world. Comet was up there. What? Like big sexy comet was in the sky. <laughs> okay. Um, big but sexy comet. You don't find comets. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, but just there, there are Maybe other things going on in the world. I mean, things were stirring in the north, and I, I just always um, interpreted it as like the dragons just were just sort of happened at. A very uh, definitely yeah. <laughs> a very convenient narrative moment. Well, I want to I want to share something I learned at uh, a different a, a different convention recently, which is that um, and I'm a big H.P. Lovecraft fan, but somehow I missed this because there's a, a a being in the extended Lovecraft universe that you know he didn't create it, but he someone else created this. It was a friend of, of George R. R. Martin's who created this creature, and there's an elder god in the Lovecraft mythos called Groth, and Groth is a red planet that floats around the cosmos singing like a siren song and it awakens mm. old powers wherever mm. it, whatever planets it passes by. And so that's the Red Comet in this case. It's like, so anyone who thought that the, the theory that the Red Comet is awakening old powers is dramatically boosted by this, this, this cre the existence of this uh, creature from another mythos because George was deeply involved in all that and it was his personal friend that made that creature. So anyway, I want to throw that out there. Uh, Sandra. We have a Targaryen that we know is a war that's been raised from the dead. Does anyone think there might be a connection to the Targaryen dragon that's been raised from the dead? I mean, everyone talks about Bran, but is anyone arguing for... Yeah, John, undead John riding undead dragon? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there, it's, it, that theory's out there. I think it's appeared since we saw that that happened on the TV show because it wouldn't have really been around before that because people didn't have that idea to base theories off of. Like, oh, it, one of the dragons dying and being resurrected. How about that? So they kind of kicked off a whole round. I of wish theories, TV but. resurrected John was more magical, more obviously. Yeah, you know, it's like he just, it's like he just, it's like he was like the knight from Monty Python, the Black Knight. He's like, tis but a scratch. <laughs> I've got very high ambitions for book resurrected John as some sort of like magical ice and fire, you know, combination yeah, type wolf, thing. Black, kind of wolf, black ice armor, burning sword. Like, yeah, a little bit of like Brandon, you know, uh, like, like you know, describe Brandon with with the dragon with the Rhaegar's fire in him, or not Rhaegar's fire in him, but uh, yeah, the Danny, kind of the same like Danny. John uh, would look temper, good on the that dragon ice temper. Dragon. <laughs> I would buy that poster. <laughs> who's keeping track? I don't know who's had their hands up longer. Anybody know? Nah. <laughs> Let's go away in the back there. Uh, maybe uh, how there's come uh, there was an explosion of more dragons, but maybe uh, the food supply. There was a lot more abundance of food, so they were able to, you know, reproduce and uh, to be able to take care of the, the sustain those other dragons. Yeah, that's space and food. The dragon pit thing is certainly part of that. They were fed instead of being allowed to range and eat what they wanted. But on Dragonstone, they could just fish or steal sheep or. I'm sure they were. It could be like they're options. paralleling the Targaryen family, like because the family propagated, the dragons propagated, or something. I've mm. wondered that too. That makes sense. I mean, it's also you know possible about the uh, that they uh, Daenerys, you know, when she found out that their eggs, you know, she had the eggs that maybe you know she found somewhere that you know it takes the large amount of heat to hatch the eggs. I mean, these are part you know creatures that bring. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's why we brought up the volcanoes. I think that's, well, and that's that what they were doing great. in Summerhall, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it just wasn't quite hot enough, or maybe it was too hot. I don't know. <laughs> How about right <laughs> too green? Center. Uh, what do you guys think of the Dragonstone Garden? Because I know that there's a lot of 
Good question. Moon meteor symbols. <laughs> <laughs> the language around them is really cool. They're, talk, they're called frozen dragons, and they seem to stir through the veil of tears when Davos is there. Uh, so it's a lot of symbolism going on. I don't know if... I mean, what do you mean? What do, what do we think? Like... No, I think it's meant to feed into the idea of dragons waking from stone in general, um, because Dragonstone, the island, is very much a parallel symbol to the stone dragon eggs, and there's a lot of symbolism about waking dragons on Dragonstone, and it just sort of ties into that, I would say. It, it feeds uh, to Shireen as well, because Shireen is afraid of them. That's one of the first things we hear about them, and she also has these dreams of the dragons coming to get her, and yeah, poor, poor Shireen. <laughs> Yes. yes, and the suit of armor, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, so. the whole line, I threw it in the, in the sea during one of my blacker moods, is, is, sounds like he paid the faceless man yeah. to kill his brother. That theory makes way yeah. too much sense for me. Yeah, it fits yeah, really well. Even a, it's, it's one, it's his brother, but it's also he's kill, he wants the assassin to kill one of the five kings, and as we know, um, Robert wanted to hire a faceless man at one point to kill... Daenerys and uh, Viserys, I believe, and they couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford to kill. They're like, dude, you're broke. Like royalty, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the more important someone is, and you know, higher status, the more expensive it is. It's not necessarily even a matter of money. It's like a percentage, for, yeah. Yeah, it's you know, for someone um, like like Balon, then yeah, yeah, it would definitely a dragon egg would definitely make sense. Yeah, Michelle, what do you think? Do you, why do you think they want that dragon's egg? Uh, so I, I know it's like, you know, a bit of tinfoil, but well, I... Well, I've got a tinfoil hat right here. <laughs> do you? <laughs> I think it would look nice. Anyway, um, I, um, there's this whole thing about how in ancient Valyria, you know, because that's where the faceless men came from, they were slaves of ancient Valyria, and, you know, they founded the... were part of what founded the free city of Bravos. And they have these like underground mines where they had to work, and you know it's a little like you know sci-fi like kind of you know fancy like going and underneath the ground. I like the idea of Hardhome was a test run for like the fall of Valyria. Yes. So if they find out the dragons are you know out in the world again because you know they hear things and Daenerys is you know kind of like doing her thing and burning everything down they might be interested in getting rid of those dragons, like if they have their own agenda, which we don't know, you know, as far as canon goes, we don't know too much about, aside from you know, like What Marlin do, says, right? About yeah. building a world with no room for magic. Yeah, and, um, you know, doing the work of the many-faced god. So, so you just, we're talking about the dragon bomb theory, and what that means is Summer Hall, there was a big explosion. We don't know why, but we know there's a lot of dragon's eggs, and we know there was wildfire and maybe some sorcery. So potentially, if you do the wrong thing, these dragon's eggs can explode. So maybe that's when she talks about the test run at Hardhome. This is the idea that the faceless men have figured out how to use a dragon egg to make an explosion. And that's what happened at Summerhall, potentially. That's what happened at Valeria, potentially. And that's why they want this dragon's egg and the book of dragon secrets. Because when Hardhome is described in the books, the Night's Watch could see the fire burning for like six months after it happened, and nobody knows what happened. Like all the bodies were gone. Yeah, magic. There's something magical. Dragon bomb. Michael. Okay, I love dragon bomb theory. What up? A little bit different question. Valerian died at about 220 years old. He fought. Uh, I believe there's some mention of Aegon intervening during the, the century of blood after the duel of Valyria. Before, yeah. Uh, the, mm -hmm. my, question, my question is, uh, how many fighters before that, how, how, how easy was it, because again, eventually Magor took over uh, Valyrian also, how easy was it for them to switch riders? And also, uh, th that whole century, does it, we don't really know a whole lot about what happened after the duel of Valyria. What was, if we know anything, what was the uh, action that Valyria took in? those other dragons took during that century? Um, well, okay, so the first part of the question is what uh, is about the century of blood and what happened 
um, after the Doom and what happened to some of the other dragons and, and those other areas and what did what role did Aegon play in that, Aegon the Conqueror, and also uh, how many like how hard was it to ride a dragon that had already had a rider? And I think that's a part of the answer right there. A dragon who's had multiple riders, it's easier to, you know, the second rider is, it's going to be harder for the second rider than, say, the fifth. Because Balerion was ex- was used to. You have to smell riders. like the, the original writer. So Magor, he's like, he smelled a bit like like. He's like, ah, oh, you smell like Dad. Okay. In the yellow shirt <laughs> over there, I had a question for a while now. Um, <coughs> so back to Summerhall with eggs, eggs basically. Um, <laughs> you guys were saying that they were destroyed in the fire, and then they were brought back to life. I'm just wondering, like, is it possible that they survived yeah. being petrified stone because? You know, Danny puts her eggs in the great brazier, whatever, and then dragons of fire make flesh. Why wouldn't they survive that? They may, yeah, we don't know. Anything's possible, pretty much. Right? Well, let me let me back up because we didn't we didn't actually answer the second part of his question about Century of Blood. Um, oh, sorry. There was uh, a war. Basically, a lot of the different um, free cities took this opportunity to become independent, but Volantis specifically wanted to try to reconquer everything and become the new Valyria because they were the, they had the closest ties to Valyria. And Aegon actually fought against that. So Aegon fought against the heirs to Valyria to prevent that from happening. I think that may have been part of his long-term plan because I think if an empire is reestablished, a Valyrian freehold is reestablished on Essos, that might, yeah, they might see him as a threat of his plans of conquest. So I think it's better for him if the free cities are independent for his uh, his future plans. Um, I think so, but I th- I don't think it's super high on the list because well, you mean Aegon's conquest or the Century so of Blood? Doom of Valeria all the way up to Aegon's conquest. Oh, okay. I I don't. I would love to see that. I don't know that it's maybe um, one of the ones they're seriously considering. The TV shows awesome. always, <laughs> they're always afraid of skipping a lot of time because you have to get new yeah. actors and they, you know. Okay, so let's go back to her question, which I've now forgotten. Uh, <laughs> she was just asking, is it possible that the dragon's eggs at Summerhold did not explode oh, or burn? Yeah. And absolutely, it's possible. I think it's possible. I would, I would say, I would guess no, because wildfire is so destructive and it's supposed to destroy even stone. But, uh, but if they're there... If they weren't destroyed, they'd be kind of in the rubble somewhere. I don't know that anyone would have re-extracted them, so that's possible that they're still buried there if they're... Uh, Follow-up. Yeah. Rhaegar spent so much time there, isn't it possible that he found them? It, I guess so, but it doesn't seem like he went there to, to do any sort It seems like he would need like a whole squad to do any kind of excavation, you know, because it would, would be pretty severe. Um, and uh, Rhaegar archaeologist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it didn't really work, but... <laughs> Rhaegar, Indiana Rhaegar. Let's do some... Uh... <laughs> Who's next? Okay, uh, right here in front. Do you think that um, there's a possibility Rhaegar and Drogon will like, mate to produce other dragons? Because dragons are not either female nor male. They are whatever they need to be in order you know, to produce. And so, I mean, it, it, is, it is possible given the, uh, the, the, the Targaryens, you know, like Shen 4 brother sister Perry, that dragons would have that kind of same wave hmm. Certainly not like a line George is afraid to cross or anything. <laughs> it'd be kind of a it'd be kind of a cool way to have like a set up like an epilogue, you know, right. like there's still a few dragon eggs left after everything. The dragons could be gone, but yeah. then the dragon eggs left at the end. Yeah, it's not a, yeah, I wonder, I definitely, and we're, we're definitely given one clue towards that in Dance with Dragons where I think it is Viserion that starts to carve out a, a hubby, a cubby hole, and Quentin kind of sees that and, and thinks of it as nesting behavior. So I think the, the seed oh, is planted true. for that. That's good. Yeah. yeah, yeah um, you had one back there, red shirt? Yes, I kind of go with what she said. Now that we've introduced John into the equation, he is a target area out there. That he hooked up. Uh, uh, my question was, uh, are the dragons going to produce more eggs now than more Targaryens? Oh, if that's a, a link, interesting. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I wonder. I, I, the one thing that may, would give me pause on that is I like the idea of eggs, but new dragons. I don't know. The story is long enough for new dragons to come into play. <laughs> and there's also <laughs> be part of the dream. Well, for there's spring. there's also yeah. sort of the foreshadowing that like the the series is going to kind of be the end of magic. At least that's what some people yeah think. I kind of so. like that. That's idea. a strong theory. I think yeah. Um, right here. Um, so I just want to talk about the difference of the naming of dragons versus wyverns. Okay. Yeah. They're more wyverns. Yeah, they're more wyverns, but um, 
the thing is, okay, so the standard kind of a fantasy debate here. There's dragons have four legs, wyverns have oh, two. We're making George happy now. But but here's the thing. Here's how I take my, this. my dragons uh, only have two <laughs> legs because uh, animals in nature don't have six limbs except for uh, insects and spiders, and so. Sorry. <laughs> well, here's my rule. Here's what I. Here's how I take it. George's human genetics don't work like real humans, right? He's changed humans, so he can change dragons if he wants to. <laughs> uh, you know. I prefer it that way. Oh, yeah. they look awesome with like the wings. I think thing. they look more bird-like, cool. yeah, with the crawling, yeah. Uh, dragon, dragon lord shirt. Is does it say dragon lord? Oh, uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> What's your question? So I, I touched on it earlier when um, basically when the dragons started to die out, and uh, I know most of us think it was because of the uh, it was in a basically in the domes and everything. Yeah. Do you think maesters had something to do with it? I know that's a big growing problem with maesters poisoning them or figuring out how to uh, stunt dragon growth and everything. It, it is an interesting idea because, I mean, that would take power away from the Targaryens, so maybe it would depend on the, on the maester and some maesters. I mean, we saw in the show and, I mean, in the books that some are very anti-magic, so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a theory that has a lot of legs. Um, yeah, it's Marwin the Mage's theory. Yeah, he just flat out says it. Um, he doesn't say what they did. But he uh, he does mention poison. Who do you think killed breath. all the dragons last time, Slayer? Yeah. Was it brave knights with swords? He's like, no, it was the maesters. And so it, it, this is a good this is a really good question because it's like, well, the maesters can't just openly kill the dragons, but if they were to like push the Targaryens to do things that in the long term are going to undermine the yeah, those high like, towers, like never. putting them in a dragon pit. You know, I, it's, it was Magor's had that built, but yeah, maybe some maesters were like, hey, you should uh, don't you want your dragons close by? You know, have them in King's Landing. Why do you have them all the way up in Dragons? Stone. Wouldn't oh, it be better cool. to have them here and let's keep them safe inside this dome? And over time, that kind of screws them. So yeah, I could see that they hired so. crappy masons. So yeah, because they wouldn't be like you said. They can't just go out they and just fall drop some, some poison in their dragon food or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think I would. Does anyone <laughs> want to talk about the origin of dragons? By the way. Uh, he's been, okay. Yeah, we got enough time for that. Serendipity. So uh, the other comment was about uh, Danny's uh, dreams and. Uh, Dragons hatch. So I, my kind of theory, or my kind of idea, is that there's a psychic bond required to kind of birth a dragon. And it's also kind of similar to uh, wolf dreams. Like okay. Dream, wolf dreams. There's like a psychic bond. So if that were the case, dire wolves are kind of like a natural animal that exists in in planetos or whatever. So does that mean dragons actually exist, or were they genetically engineered? Like the wolf will kind of Hints at, yeah. Okay, so we should let's let, let's that. let these two go first because we have way too much to say. I was going to say uh, <laughs> we should repeat the question first. Oh, I don't know if everybody can hear that. So the question was: um, uh, There's a lot of comparisons between uh, the skin changing of the wolves and the dragon bonding with the sort of psychic connection. Uh, we know that dire wolves are natural creatures. So does that imply that the dragons are also natural creatures and not necessarily created by you know screwed up magicians or whatever? So yeah, you guys, go ahead. Take oh, it. I don't really give credence to that book, so you can skip me. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, what do you think about this, the general idea? Where did dragons come from? you think they're natural or engineered? I think, I think they come from a magical part of the world, so I, I don't think that they were necessarily... What were they created from, you know? Well, so um, the theory would be that like they took wyverns and fireworms and like cross-mated them, because the wyverns are flying dragons without fire, and the fireworms are don't have the wings, but they have the fire. So you put them together. Yeah, we have the combination okay. that they did their blood magic experiments trying to create creatures. Like, we know that they made sphinxes, for example, which is, what? <laughs> they made sphinxes? Gee. I actually think the dragons <laughs> are natural, magical creatures. Um, despite all the sort of clues about engineering and stuff, I really think that if we have wyverns and fireworms, then why couldn't we have dragons? Like, there's yeah. it's not any more magical than either, than uh, the fireworms. They both particular. work, I think, yeah. As possibilities. I could see, the, like, sort of a compromise. Like, the dragons that we know today could have been, like, sort of engineered, but dragons as creatures, like, maybe not as big or mm -hmm. as powerful or as fire- breathy, however you want to say it. Um, like, like not small in the sense of the dragons who are, like, locked away in the dragon pit, but just, like, you know, maybe they were, like... Magic big, steroids. Yeah, yeah, magic steroids. Or, like, they no, used to be, like... 
big yeah, flying dragon puppies, builder. and then now they're <laughs> airplanes. <laughs> Vitamin, it could also be that the, it could be that the genetic thing comes in with the ability to bond with the dragons. Like you have this magical creature, but they weren't, you know, trying to have any human riders until there was some freaky blood magic Valyrian stuff going on. And now they have that link. dragon sex. Yeah, something. <laughs> something not G-rated. Uh, about the whole moon cracked and that's where dragons. Oh, he, speaking of symbolism, I'll see you at four o'clock. You're gonna get him started. <laughs> I I do think that's uh, mostly symbolism, um, but I have noticed in the uh, in that Lovecraft story, uh, the doom that came to Sarnath, they have a very similar scene where these freaky monsters come out of the moon on a fortuitous night and they come down and kill everyone. And I think that imagery was definitely something that George was thinking about when he did that myth. There's an ib in that story, too. Oh, yeah. It's creepy. Uh, right here. That's, the, that's the one to read, in my opinion, if you're going to read, like, one Lovecraft. Yeah, it's like, it's like five pages, too, so uh. it's not, not exactly a big commitment. <laughs> um, in the Wolf of Ice and Fire, they mention a clutch of eggs and dragon fell that was uh, hatched by, not hatched by Vermax, but placed by a bear back. Do you think that was just time to team cheek talk about John Snow and symbolism by George's part, or do you think there's really a, a clutch of eggs there? We talked about it a little bit earlier. I do not think there's a clutch of eggs there. Um, Repeat the question for you. Whether, okay, the, the question is about whether the rumor of a clutch of eggs laid by Vermax oh, Winterfell. Is, in Winterfell is real. I, I, I'm, I kind of think no. I think it is symbolism for John because the logistics of a dragon going into the crypts is really bizarre to me. We've seen the door to the crypts, and it's not that big. Um, to me, so a dragon like do going into the lower levels, like just, hey, yeah. let me, can I dragon go in your crypt while we're, ch we're chatting? Uh, can anyone come down and give my dragon a push? He, uh, he's a bit stuck. <laughs> he rode this dragon to Winterfell from Dragonstone, so it is at least a sizable dragon. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, just the logistics of that are kind of weird to me. It, it seems like it's a scatter shot of dragon in Winterfell symbolism. Like the small folk think that maybe there's a dragon under there and that's why the springs are hot or maybe there's an egg under there and really it's it's John, right? Well, I have... You guys can feel free to complete completely shoot me down, but we're talking about magical creatures. Shoot you down, Viserion. Shoot you down. <laughs> <laughs> why would we do that? Was, that was a good one. You walked one. right into that um, <laughs> No. Um, Blue, really. But what do you guys think of the fact that um, the Targaryens themselves are magical? Well, they have like, dragon babies every once in a while. So yeah, I think they are. Yeah, I think you're right. The, the whole blood of the dragon thing is at least partly literal. And the yeah. Starks, too. I keep thinking about... I can't think about the Targaryens without thinking about the Starks because look at their sigils. It's the dire wolf and the dragon, these, these yeah. animals that they have all of these connections with. So, But they also are both kind of dying out. The Targaryens are almost died out, and then the, the Starks are, mm. are getting a checked off so i mean that that kind of magic and in its own way if they are sort of magical is also part because i do think that there is sort of this theme of magic leaving and i was on a panel and they're like this is lord of the rings and like all the elves are leaving and but yeah so so that's something that i i really haven't heard anyone say so i wanted to know there are, what you guys thought yeah Targaryen. there's there's three cases of the dragon baby thing danny's one and then Rhaenyra has one and then uh, Magor's Magor. kids. A couple. A couple of weird ones, yeah. Go ahead, Michelle. And then um, the Targaryens are one of the few families in Westeros that have green seers in their family as well. Um, that can't uh, in, be an accident. Yeah, in, in uh, the first Duncan Egg story, uh, there, there are so many Targaryens in there, but one of them is a green seer and they see like one of them dying like, and it ends up being like that seven on seven uh, Oh, you mean like he's got the prophetic dreams? Yeah, Daron, yeah. Daron the drunkard. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, um, I thought you were talking about like, just the fact that Blood Raven <laughs> like and John are both like <laughs> skin changers. I mean, I mean that, that, uh, that's another factor. Yeah. But I'm, I'm talking specifically about green seeing. Oh, okay. So you think the dragon dreams might be like having to do something with that? Possibly. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah, I, I, we we certainly talked a lot, and uh, both LML and I and, and other people have talked about this. Maybe you guys have as well. The concept that some of the magic or a lot of the magic in Planetos, Teros, whatever world you want to use, uh, is kind of overlapped. You know, you see certain, like, Melisandre gets prophecies from fire, and uh, other people get prophecies from dreams or from, you know, looking into different things, uh, like glass candles or what have you. So there's all, but they're all basically the same thing. There's some way to see the future. 
And <clears throat> whether this is, you know, gods or some sort of magical energy that anyone can tap into that different cultures have given a different name. My favorite example is that Mel can access a hinge of the world that's made out of ice in the far north and it somehow makes her fire magic stronger. Yeah, right? So that so tells that, you yeah, that there's a really common magical mana of, of the source. This series is literally called A Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> I just wanted to loop oh. back to that. <laughs> so maybe we're on the right track, guys. <laughs> we figured it out. <laughs> Uh, so guys, yeah, there's here. two minutes left. Okay, two minutes. We'll take these two here. You two, uh, you and then you in the front here. Yeah, you. Um, what do you think about the tall and girls dream about the second chance of the dragons? Okay, well, that one's from a spoiler chapter. Are we allowed to talk about the Ariane spoiler chapter? I mean, I, I haven't read it. So Sounds I prefer ominous. Not. Can okay. you talk to Aziz after? Yeah, just talk to me after. <laughs> Thank and you. Right here in the front, in the black. Um, you talk about the egg, there may be eggs in Winterfell. Does it necessarily have to be? That's true. There's Allison. actually a rumor that, that her dragon layeth left an egg at the wall. Sam mentions it really quickly, I noticed, just the other day. So we could, it could be this uh, related rumor, or you know how rumors kind of like a telephone game. Rumor right. goes through 20 people and it changes, so it could be. But the point is, there's a couple of different egg stories in the north with dragons maybe leaving eggs there and one Look of under your seats the everyone true. there might be a dragon's egg <laughs> never know they're everywhere but she was the only queen that went north that everyone liked so. yeah yeah <laughs> that's a good point she might have been the only queen that went north at all but still that's uh that's pretty important okay i guess we do have one more chance for one more right here uh tale of duncan egg which i'm sure a lot of us love there's a part in there where duck is looking at egg and he sees that the guy he loves the heat, right? And it made me think the first time, okay, is this guy a, far, a fireproof Targaryen? Mm. And, then, and then there's those there's those eggs at Summerhall. And unfortunately, we know how Duncan Egg is going to end, right? Very sadly. <laughs> is there a possibility, right? Because Egg is one year younger than Maester Aemon, that Egg survives Summerhall. You remember there's that parchment that says we would not have been nope. saved if not for the help of, and then it just cuts off, right? There. Yeah. That Maester who writes it. Is it possible that Dunk and or Egg <coughs> survived those are the eggs that eventually got to Illyria Mopathis, and that is the end of Duncan Egg. They're hanging out with Rhaegar and Jill at Hightower somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dead Targaryens club. Yeah. The Dunk actually survives that. He just dis he doesn't want to be king. Hmm. He's the fourth son of a fourth son, never in intended on being king, and, and, and just said, screw it all and, and, and fake his own death. Uh, well, he, we know he was uh, really, really wanted to change Westeros' government. Um, he really wanted to give more power to the common people and take power away from the nobles, but his um, didn't work because, for a lot of reasons that we don't have time to get into. But uh, so I think I think he was pretty genuine in his attempt. I don't know that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't know what he would accomplish by that. It's interesting, but um, by now, if that were true, he would certainly be dead by now, because um, that would have been. Summer Hall was was 259. Yeah. <laughs> so he could be, I'd be uh, that would be Eamon's age. Yeah, I see what you mean there. Um, no, I think there's, uh, the thing is, there's too many people who knew Eamon. Um, like, Blood Raven was on the wall at the same time as Eamon and a lot of other people. So I think there would be too many people that would know them on site. It would be kind of difficult to pull off. And considering but, uh, how many people were there, because that was the day Rhaegar Targaryen was born, and he was born at Summerhall, it'd be kind of hard to sneak out of there. Because like, yeah. even if you're going to a part that's not on fire, it's, oh, your family's here too. And yeah, there were a good number of survivors, even though a lot of people died. Yep. It's that time, everyone. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks for all the questions. You guys basically drove the panel today, so nice job. I'm going to go buy some shit. A very special thank you to all of my patrons and everyone who donated to the Con of Thrones fundraiser live stream. I couldn't have done it without you, so I hope you enjoy. Thanks, everyone, from the bottom of my fiery, fiery heart.